gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. His peace is a supernatural peace, isn't it? That surpasses all understanding. That in the midst of chaos and trouble, that we can experience something very unique that the world doesn't experience. In Stephen's account, um, let's talk about that. I'd like a, a little bit of um, participation on your part to tell me what um, kind of a man was Stephen from Acts 6 and 7. What was he described as? He was powerful. What else? He was what? He was full of the Holy Spirit, wasn't he? He said he was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. What else? Sue. He must have shown, shown some amazing qualities because they chose him to be amongst those that would help distribute the kingdom. He was. They, and they, they specifically said they wanted men of good reputation, didn't they? I found it really interesting that it was the Hellenistic Jews that were complaining that their women were um, being overlooked in that daily distribution. And the group of men that they chose were Hellenistic Jews. Uh, Stephen, his name uh, comes from Stephanos. It's a Greek, um, and they were very Greek culture, very Greek-influenced people. So he was, he was chosen among six others. What did it say about his speech? He had boldness, didn't he? And he was irrefutable. He said he spoke with irrefutable wisdom and of the Spirit. And that to me is really powerful. We'll talk more about that in a little while. What about uh, the charges that were brought up against him? They were fake. They had they had brought they had brought false charges against him. What does that remind you of? Jesus. I see a lot. Do you see a lot of parables with Stephen and Christ? I do too. What did they say when he was being questioned? What did he look like? What was his appearance like? He had a face like an angel. And I I love. Uh, what did Bethany say last week in the nursery? He he had a physical reaction to a spiritual condition. You know, like much like Moses. Moses' face shone because he was before the presence of God, wasn't he? Do you think he was uh, that they loved him? The group that were that he was uh, being brought up against? No, he was hated, wasn't he? And we see that by their actions. They're they're um, gnashing their teeth at him. They're stopping stopping their ears up. They don't want to hear anymore. And they're running out him with a mob. But what does he see while this is going on? He sees a vision of heaven, doesn't he? And he sees Jesus at the right hand of God. He sees the glory of God. That really speaks to me. That in the midst of that judgment and condemnation, that he sees Jesus. He was cast out of the city, and he was stoned, and yet... What is his heart's cry as he's uh, being stoned? Don't, get this Don't blame them. He's forgiving them, isn't he? Really reveals a heart attitude of, of Stephen. And, and I, as I looked at that, I, you know, those questions come to my mind. How, did, how could he do this? And yet Jesus prepares us. I know in, uh, in our society, our culture today, we know that the best... The best um, companies that succeed plan well, right? They look at every um, contingency and they're prepared. They know what's going to happen. And Jesus does that for us. He prepares us. Because he says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And I think it's keeping that heavenly perspective. Um, the disciples didn't always get it that um, Jesus was always talking about the kingdom of heaven, right? They wanted a kingdom set up here on earth. And I think sometimes that's uh, my shortcoming is that I want, I want answers 
to my needs here on earth. And sometimes I lose sight that uh, our goal is our goal is eternal. It's not here and now. He tells us what to expect. Um, I've asked some of my friends from our small group to read scripture for us, and I'm going to ask Jackie Eckelberger to read John 16, 1 to 4. Here's Jackie. John 16, 1 to 4. I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith, for you will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time is coming when those who follow you still think they are doing a holy service for God. This is because they have never known the Father or me. Yes, I'm telling you these things now, so that when they happen, you will remember my warning. Thank you, Jackie. So Jesus doesn't want to be in fear or, um, uh, or for the world's hatred and persecution of Christians. He doesn't that want that to be a stumbling block for us. Okay, he's telling about it ahead of time. And he's not telling about it to, to instill that fear in us, but to let us know that he's going to be with us. And, um, and what to expect so that when it happens, we can realize that one, his word is true, right? That what he said came to pass. And two, that we can trust him. So he tells us that they'll hate us. He tells us that, uh, that they'll persecute us. And that they'll bring you under judgment. B, will you read um, Matthew 10, 17 to 26? Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be blocked in the synagogues. On my account, you will be brought to the governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. When they arrest you, do not worry about what you're saying or what to say. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking from the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will be That is John 10, 17 to 26. Oh, I'm sorry, I just said John. Matthew. You're not going to find his job. So they'll bring you under judgment and they'll kill you. And, and, and um, why, why, why is this? Why are they doing this? John 16, 3 that we heard earlier said that because they have not known the Father nor me. They don't know Jesus and they don't know the Father. Those are your fill in the blanks. He also says in John 15, 19, that you are not of the world but are called out of the world. He says if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Sue? Read is going to read for us um, John 8, 23 to 24, and 40 to 47. Is 
he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Yet because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? I am telling the truth. Why don't you believe me? Whoever belongs to God hears what God says. The reason you do not, do not hear is what is that you do not belong to God. Pretty powerful, huh? We're seeing it's a spiritual battle, too. That father of lies is there accusing, bringing the accusation. And it says, what did it say he was from the very beginning? He's a liar, and what else? He's a murderer. He's a murderer. And that's what we see happening. But um, will that stop the work of God? No. What did he do when the people were uh, persecuted in one city? They went to another. And what happened with the gospel? It spread. He commands us not to fear. Let's turn to Matthew 10, 26 and 28. <laughs> Therefore, do not fear them. For there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. And verse 28 says, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. He also commands us, um, well, let's go back. He, he, in that command not to fear, we saw that with um, in Old Testament to Joshua. What was the command to Joshua? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be afraid. Why? The Lord your God is with you wherever you go. He commands us to love in Matthew 5, 43 to 44. In 43 it says, You have heard that it was said, You should love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies, and bless those who curse you, and do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good, and it sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So it's actually, it's an imperative, right? He's telling us not to fear, and he's telling us not to love. He teaches by example. And I put this, I put, um, uh, this description of what Jesus has accomplished for us and what the parallel with Stephen here. He says of himself in John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He came to do the will of the Father, something that was decided before he ever left heaven. I love um, the scripture in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. It says, Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as men, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And again, he made that, um, that determination, surrendered his will um, before his arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's crying out to God, not my will, but thine be done. He spoke only what um, he, the Father gave him to speak. He did signs and wonders. We see parallels with um, Stephen because Stephen was um, following Christ, right? He was following his example. But Jesus, um, when he bore that... Uh, the punishment of sin and death on the cross, and he considered it, um, he did it, considering it joy for, um, what's the, has it said, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. On the cross, he asked the Father to give, forgive those who put him there, and we know that he rose again by over the 500 that had seen him, and he ascended to heaven. He equips us by his by his spirit because he because he died in resurrection and went to heaven he was able to send his spirit um Jenna, will you read john 14 16 to 21 
So what do we hear in that? That he is our helper, right? He is, he is where? He's within us. He teaches us all things. He reminds us of Christ's teachings. And Christ actually manifests himself to us, doesn't he? I, uh, uh, he gives us what to say, Matthew 10, 19 to 20. It said, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it's not you who speaks, but it's the spirit of the Father who speaks in you. And we saw that beautifully demonstrated in Stephen's response to the uh, Sanhedrin. How could a mere man give that um, eloquent history uh, on his own? And, and, and as poignant as it was, and as deliberate as it was, um, showing them how, how wrong they were. And it says um, that they were, they were, was it cut to the heart? Is that what it said? Did it bring them to repentance? No, it brought them to anger too, didn't it? It gives us boldness. In 1 John 4, 17, it says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And uh, I look at the boldness of Stephen, and you know that that was not his own strength, but that was Christ in him. Faith is given, Romans 12, 3b says, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. And Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we, as we are in his word and, and, and hear his word, he speaks to our heart the truth and our spirit is quickened within us and it gives us boldness and it gives us that ability to do what we think we cannot do. I, I was able to witness something really cool. Um, one of my friend's mothers just passed away. She was 92 years old. And um, Lydia Grubb actually had come in and spent some time with her and her mom before she passed. And um, my friend's daughter and two little kids came in. And so Lydia took the kids out into the uh, Serenity Garden and said to the little boy, you know, your grandma's going to go to heaven soon. And he got all excited and he said, I know. And she said, well, how do you know? Well, God told me. And um, the day of the funeral, when I was there, the funeral had ended, and the casket was opened, and my friend and her daughter were at the front crying, grieving of the loss that they had. But little CJ was bouncing around, shaking his arms in the air, but she's alive in heaven! <laughs> and I just thought it was so cool because it's such a, that faith of a child, you know, it's just that it remembered me, it reminded me of when I was a little girl and how God became so very real to me when um, women were faithful. I, I was in the hospital the first eight years of my life right now, and I was given a death sentence. I wasn't supposed to live. In fact, I had to go to death therapy because many of the children on my ward did die. And so learning how to deal with that and then supposedly coming to terms with the fact that I was not going to be on the earth much longer, they kicked me out because I would say to them that, that God told me I'm going to win. So when God speaks something to our heart, it takes root and it takes hold. And nothing anyone else can say or do can shake that. Um, I see in scripture that fear is displaced with purpose. That others may believe. It's given, um, we, we know that persecution came in Matthew 10, 18. He says, you will be brought before governors and kings for my name's sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. So it's given for a purpose that, that others may believe. We saw that the uh, gospel sp has spread. We see in um, countries where persecution is very high. In fact, I was just re-watching on um, YouTube, I think it was on YouTube, uh, the story of a young, let's see, it was uh, Russia and Amar. They're in the Middle East. It's an open doors video. And it shows how 
um, separately. Jesus Christ had manifested himself to them. They saw a vision of Christ. And to one he said, I am your Savior, come follow me. And to the other he said, I am Christ. And I'm hearing this on Christian radio over and over and over again of people that are getting visions of Christ in these Muslim countries where Christians are highly, highly persecuted. There's purpose in this. Christ reveals himself. Others may, may believe. It's also for um, God's work to be evidenced in you. Matthew 10, 19 to 20 says, It's not you who speaks, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. To me, that's such an awesome um, working of the Holy Spirit that he uses um, flawed individuals to spread his message and to manifest himself through. And then it says, God's love is perfected in you. 1 John 4, 17 to 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not made me perfect in love. How are we made perfect in love? Let's look back a few verses. In 1 John 4, 12 to 16, he says, No one has seen God in any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. We know that um, there's an eternal reward. John 5, 24 says, Most truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into judgment, eternal judgment, but is passed from death to life. James 1, 12 said, Blessed is he who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to him who love him. Revelation 2, 10, speaking of persecution to come in one of the churches, it says, Do not fear of those things which you are about to suffer, because the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Uh, I've asked Ellie uh, Moore to read Romans 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we have now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given us. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? He's poured out his Holy Spirit in us, his love in us. 1 John 5, 4 says that um, faith gives us the victory. It says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And is it something we muster up ourselves? That's the beautiful thing of it, isn't it? It's that gift of God. It's his working in us that deposits that faith. It's his proving his word to us time and time again when we see Jesus. When we come to that point, where um, we understand the love that he has for us and all that he has done for us, the forgiveness that he offers us, then at that time, then we can say like Jesus and Stephen did, Father, forgive them. You know, that's something Jesus taught us how to pray in Matthew, right? Matthew 6. Father, forgive us as we forgive those. Why does he say later if we don't forgive? And he won't forgive us. It's not a choice, is it? But it is an, it, it is an inner working of his, of his spirit. It's not something we have to strive for. It's something we have to surrender. It's not pleasant at the time, but it's something that his work that he does in us, that he allows us to forgive, and then we're able to lay our own lives down. And then we see Jesus in the vision of heaven. Matthew 6, 26 to 64, when Jesus was um, before the Sanhedrin, he says, Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. In 1 John 5, verse 20, 
says that he's given us an understanding that we may know him who is true, that we are in him who is true. Jesus Christ, the eternal God. Friend, do you want to pull it? I give, to you, I give to you, not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. His peace is a supernatural peace, isn't it? That surpasses all understanding. That in the midst of chaos and trouble, that we can experience something very unique that the world doesn't experience. In Stephen's account, um, Let's talk about that. I'd like a, a little bit of um, participation on your part to tell me what um, kind of a man was Stephen from Acts 6 and 7. What was he described as? He was powerful. What else? He was what? He was full of the Holy Spirit, wasn't he? So he was full of faith and the Holy Spirit. What else? Soon. He must have shown, shown some amazing qualities because they chose him to be amongst those that would help strengthen the kingdom. He was. They, and they, they specifically said they wanted men of good reputation, didn't they? I found it really interesting that it was the Hellenistic Jews that were complaining that their women were um, being overlooked in that daily distribution. And the group of men that they chose were Hellenistic Jews. Uh, Stephen, his name uh, comes from Stephanos, it's a Greek, um, and they were very Greek culture, very Greek influenced people. So he was, he was chosen among six others. What did it say about his speech? He had boldness, didn't he? And he was irrefutable said he spoke with irrefutable wisdom and of the Spirit. And that, to me, is really powerful. We'll talk more about that in a little while. What about um, the charges that were brought up against him? Fake. They were fake. fake. They, had, they, had brought, they had brought false charges against him. What does that remind you of? Yeah. Jesus. I see a lot. Do you see a lot of parables with Stephen and Christ? I do too. What did they say when he was being questioned? What did he look like? What was his appearance like? He had a face like an angel. And I, I love, uh, what did Bethany say last week in the nursery? He, he had a physical reaction to a spiritual condition. You know, like much like Moses. Moses' face shone because he was before the presence of God, wasn't he? Do you think he was uh, that they loved him, the group that were that he was uh, being brought up against? No, he was hated, wasn't he? And we see that by their actions. They're they're uh, gnashing their teeth at him. They're stopping stopping their ears up. They don't want to hear anymore, and they're running at him at, with a mob. But what does he see while this is going on? He sees a vision of heaven, doesn't he? And he sees Jesus at the right hand of God. He sees the glory of God. That really speaks to me. That in the midst of that judgment and condemnation, that he sees Jesus. He was cast out of the city, and he was stoned, and yet, what is his heart's cry as he's uh, being stoned? Don't get this done. Don't blame them. He's forgiving them, isn't he? really reveals a heart attitude of, of Stephen. And, and I, as I looked at that, you know, those questions come to my mind. How, did, how could he do this? And yet Jesus prepares us. I know in, uh, in our society, our culture today, we know that the best, the best um, companies that succeed plan well, right? They look at every contingency and they're prepared. They know what's going to happen. And Jesus does that for us. He prepares us. Because he says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. 
but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And I think it's keeping that heavenly perspective. Um, the disciples didn't always get it that um, Jesus was always talking about the kingdom of heaven, right? They wanted the kingdom set up here on earth. And I think sometimes that's uh, my shortcoming is that I want, I want answers to my needs here on earth. And sometimes I lose sight that uh, our goal is, our goal is eternal. It's not here and now. He tells us what to expect. Um, I've asked some of my friends from our small group to read scripture for us. And I'm going to ask Jackie Eckelberger to read John 16, 1 to 4. Here's Jackie. John 16, 1 to 4. I have told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. For you will be expelled from the synagogues, and the time is coming when those who hear you still think they are doing a holy service for God. I can that, that moment that Stephen saw heaven open and saw Jesus. And the moment that Jesus says he's coming back, and we will see him in all of his glory. Um, that, that relationship with that the presence of his spirit, that's what gives us strength. That no matter what faces us, that we know we have peace in him and we can trust him. He's a good God. It's a prayer. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for the story of Stephen where we can see that God, you truly came through for him. God, your spirit was manifested in his life, even though he was martyred for you as many other Christians across our world see in the world now that almost a third of our, our world is under heavy persecution right now. And God, I lift up those, Father, who are being um, persecuted and tormented and martyred for their faith, and I pray for strength. I pray, God, that the reality of you will fill the room wherever they are. And Lord, in the moments of fear that we may have or uncertainty in times in our own lives. God, I pray that your truth um, will just reign in our hearts and minds, that we can cast down every vain imagination that rises above the knowledge of you and know, God, that your word is true and that you will never leave us or forsake us and that there is an eternity beyond here and now. And Father, that we will be with you. We will see you face to face for all of eternity, and I thank you for that. I ask you to be with each one as she leaves, um, safe travels on the uh, icy roads outside, and just be with us. Continue to speak to our hearts and lead us and guide us. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.